Foundation 45 is a 501c3 nonprofit that funds counseling services for mental health, addiction, and suicide survivors. In addition to providing services, it works to break the stigma surrounding these topics. Foundation 45 recognizes that musicians, artists, and creative types are often at a higher risk for issues with mental health and addiction. The organization's goal is to serve the Dallas-Fort Worth creative community by providing free, top-tier mental health and recovery services. You can learn more about Foundation 45 at foundation45.org. Foundation 45. Live fast, die old. I'm Andrew Sherman. I'm a Texas transplant who has always been in pursuit of art as a career. I've played in bands, pursued an acting career in Hollywood, but I found it behind the lens of a camera here in Dallas, Texas. I was born in New York, I've lived in Chicago, Los Angeles, Austin, but I love Dallas. There's a magical artistic scene in Dallas that mostly goes unnoticed to the outside world. This podcast is focused on what makes it so special and the people who make it thrive artistically. If you don't live here, and even if you do, you might not have heard of them. This is the Dallas Famous Podcast. So who you gonna be? Who you gonna be when you are? Who you gonna be? Who you gonna be when you are? For us, yeah. This week on the Dallas Famous Podcast, we have Desi Five. Desi is all Dallas, growing up in the streets of Deep Ellum in his grandmother's restaurant. Desi had an early connection with some of the great diva singers, and after growing up as a self-proclaimed band geek, Des finally reached his true form as an outlandish and dynamic singer and performer. Desi is also the brainchild behind the new Dallas Entertainment Awards. We get the story and details about this exciting event that has the entire Dallas arts community buzzing. Desi is also working on new recordings that push the limits of his former sounds. It's always a blast talking to Desi, and there's no one like him, so enjoy this chat. Hey, we are back here at the Deep Elm Community Center, and I'm sitting with Desi, Desmond, is it Lemon, Lehman? Lehman. Lehman. Okay, God, I, why didn't I ask you that before we went on the air? That's stupid. It's okay. It's part of the it's part of the character of the show. So I, I, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's happened before. It's true. Yeah. I mean, I've always known you as Desi Five, and then just Desi. So I just I, then I was like Facebook. It's like that's his full name. That's my full name. Okay. That's what I was before two thousand eight. Eight. Okay. I named myself Desi Five in two thousand eight. Okay. Yeah. Where Where did that come from? Uh, I grew up watching I Love Lucy. Okay. Uh, my name is Desmond, uh-huh. right, naturally. So um, at the end, this has been a Desi Lou production, right? And I was always, and I always wanted to be a musician. So, and his name is Desi Arnaz, and I always thought that I was kind of like him type stuff. So huh. that's why I decided to call myself Desi. Nobody named my family always either called me Desmond or that guy over there. No, <laughs> <laughs> right? But uh, yeah, I, I, Desi. And then the five came from, like, okay, you know, um, I've been a performer and a musician all my life. But I was always afraid to do it in front of people because I was scared I was going to get clocked as gay. Mm. So um, in two, I want to say by the time when I was 26, I kind of researched Erica Badu and she, uh, learned about this five percenter situation. Mm-hmm. And then um, I took, you know, it just kind of like took me to a whole nother realm. And I adopted the, you know, there's five letters in the number, I mean the word five. And we have... And uh, as far as our anatomy, you know, head, arm, arm, leg, leg, that's five points. Um, there's five points to a star. Um, it's just five. And then I, I was online for a music fraternity. There was five of us online. And mm-hmm. so I was just, and so that five gave me, is like my shield of confidence to like, it doesn't matter who you are. Show, I mean, like, or what you fear, fear show them who you are. And that five is like my protection. Hmm. Bam. There you wow. go. Okay. Desi five. Yeah. I like it. Okay. Solid. Um, so I, I, I'll admit I did a little research on you, um, which was hard to do because <laughs> there's not as much on you as online as I would have thought. It's uh, not. But so you're, you're like a deep Ellum kid, right? 100%. Yeah. Like your yeah. grandmother had a restaurant. Is that right? Yeah. Um, on where CBC is, um, as well as serious pizza, but the one on where CBC is, is where we were the longest. Um, she was there for like 40 years. Oh, wow. Um, and then we moved over to where Serious Pizza is, and we were there for like a good two or three, maybe two years. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, and it completely closed. Mm. What yeah. was it called? Vern's Place. Okay. Yeah, it was a little soul food shack. A lot of the, I was just hanging at three links, and Amy and them were telling me how 
they used to stop by there and get the dumplings and the and the beef stew and the oh. short ribs. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It so. was a deep on the place. She fed everybody. So somebody in deep back in the day, they all ate here. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> nice. So, they, so you were like basically just in this neighborhood from like like, I mean, what was that like? Was it what was it like as a kid being around here? You know, when you think about it, where Thunderbird is, there used to be an actual gas station. Mm-hmm. And I remember going to that gas station. It was a filling station because that's what we called it back then. Right. And they actually pumped the gas for us. Sure, sure. So I remember the guy that was the owner of it, he would always give me like little toy cars and stuff. So I would get excited to go there. And then right across from Thunderbird is the Old Nations Bank. Mm-hmm. That's where my grandmother's safety deposit was. Uh, um, so we went there once a week, you know, to uh-huh. put stuff in there. And then... Across where that Seven Eleven is is where I got my first car because used to be a car dealership. <laughs> oh wow! So you really did. This really is your God. This must be even because it's surreal to me. And I've been here like eight years. Like you, you've seen this like turnaround. Oh what, yeah. Ten times? How many oh, times? Yeah. I mean, we used to have Coyote Ugly here. <laughs> oh right, right. You know it's funny. I was an extra in that film. Shut up. Yeah, yeah. Just oh, random. Wow, that's your famous. Man, no wonder, almost famous. Almost one. famous is right. <laughs> like you don't see me in the movie or anything. Yeah, yeah. And then I think you were talking before we started. Like you kind of were a band geek first, right? Is mm-hmm. that like your? Well, no. Actually, was that your first introduction to music? Uh, like influence? I would say as far as being, as far as conforming and um, getting some sense of structure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, band. I, I want. I was maybe nine or ten and i was introduced to the world of the five lines and four spaces Mm -hmm. um but yeah i I started out in band and i I was a clarinetist for 17 years Mm. went to college principal clarinetist cbdna intercollegiate band the walt disney band all all of the things that i could do on a win ensemble level that's what i was doing as a clarinetist i don't think i knew anything about that that's cool Yeah, yeah yeah I mean, you learned something. <laughs> I know, but like you know, I mean, doesn't uh, who brings the like who plays the flute? Who is that? That's doing Lizzo. The, like, can't, why have we seen a clarinet come out? I mean, I was all too. I was already afraid to come out and sing. You know, I mean, come on, a big black black gay guy playing the clarinet. <laughs> I know, but now I was afraid. But now I'm I saying. Mean, but now I, you know, I thought of even when I saw Lizzo out playing "Flight of the Bumblebee." Yeah, and all of those fun things, and I, I was like, maybe I would incorporate it, but I just haven't really. Okay, like, all right. Just... Plus, when I was in New York, I was going through hard times, and I pawned it. Oh, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> well, you know, it just leaves the room for a more ornate horn to come into your life, exactly. right? One day I'm going to buy that same exact clarinet. It was a, R, a R13 um, buffet, which is like top. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And so, and then, okay, so you're doing that, um, but I, I feel like I read that you were also influenced by like the divas, the singers. Yes. But, yeah, that that's just going to come with growing up in school and 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 which I mean I'm not taking it lightly but yeah, I Mary J Blige, Tony Braxton were like queens to me. Mm-hmm. Um that's who I grew up SWV and Jodeci and all of those cats and that's big I mean, as far as singing Whitney Houston and TLC all that that moment was very important to me so I was introduced to those divas, not knowing that I wanted to sing. Mm. I always knew I wanted to do something because mm-hmm. I used to always make a stage and I would like pretend like my toys were my audience. I've always knew that I was going to oh, do wow. something, uh-huh. but I just didn't know exactly what. Um, but yeah, the divas, my mom, I grew up with my grandmother because my mom lived a very fast paced lifestyle. And so my grandmother's like, we'll keep them slow over here. Mm. Um, and my grandmother didn't listen to like worldly music, as we say. So we only listened to Christian and gospel music and watch TBN and Paul and Jan and all of that. And huh. It was just surrounding me. And when I would go visit my mom in the summer, um, that's where I could listen to Whitney and all of the fun stuff. Uh-huh. And so Mary J. Blige, this was in 97. And I would, how old was I in 97? Anyway, you know, I'm about 16, I guess. <laughs> it was in 97, and I was visiting my mom. And Mary J. Blige had just come out with the Share My World album. And there's a song on there called, um, it's like the days of the week, Monday, a friend of mine. And so I used to play that song so much. And my mom almost, she ripped the CD out of the player, <laughs> gave me the CD and the CD player and said, if you don't play this song anymore, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Guess you liked it. And so I packed up and I have my first CD player and mu- worldly music in my grandmother's house. And she was like, you can pick two CDs. So I picked quite naturally the Mary J. Blige and then the Tony Braxton album. 
and those that was my I used to sing that's the music and just be in my own little world and didn't know anything about love and life but I know I felt that music and that uh-huh. soul huh. you know uh-huh. and that's I mean being introduced to the divas and then all of a sudden these three girls Destiny's Child come to the picture and me and my friends used to pretend like we were them and, <laughs> you know of course I was always Beyonce <laughs> even in the beginning before she was be big Beyonce and, right. um, yeah and I just I've always had that sense of going to drag I used to sneak to drag shows when I was a teenager mm-hmm. and I would go we would say we're spending the night at each other's house and then go to the brick and so I used to watch like Jody Malone and and, 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 and Silky O'Hara Monroe and all of those guys perform, but they were lip syncing and it was just the glamour of it. And I was like, oh, sh-. so it's just a whole lot just. <laughs> sure. Come, yeah. So, I mean, okay, I mean, you brought it up. I mean, so at this point, I guess you're closeted, I guess you would call it. I wouldn't say closeted. I just didn't announce. <laughs> okay, got it. I got it. But, but if you ask me, I'd be like, I mean, quite naturally, look at me. I mean. <laughs> uh, but okay, but I, I don't know why this just strikes me because like you've only mentioned female singers. And then you're emulating female singers, yeah. but then you're you said earlier that you're not you didn't want to like be outed by performance. So what you like you couldn't have performed in a way that you felt was not completely gay. I don't. Well, you have to think about it. Like I said, I looked up to female singers almost like Luther Vandross. He looked up to all of those Dion Warwick's and all of that stuff. I looked up to female singers, but there was not a male singer, right? That I felt comfortable saying I want to be like. So I was afraid. Because, oh, okay. you know, growing up in school and growing up as a, a, a anybody that's queer, and when I say queer, that goes all ways. People look at you and weird and they talk about you the moment you walk in. So you just have that armor up in everything that you do. Mm. So even with me, I was afraid to show that I could sing or to even sing because I was just afraid of it. He gay. He ain't gay. So you already knew kind of that you could sing. It just you had no yeah, idea how you knew. were going to put that out. Yeah, okay, I always okay. knew I had the gift. I, I sang in church and oh, okay. I, my my in, in when I was a music major, principles of voice. I got extra money for studying vocals, and so I know I knew that I could sing. I even went through a whole period of my voice change because I have a really high voice. It was around the time in, when Erica Badu came out with uh, Baduism, because I remember. Um, practicing my barry saxophone at the time and trying to sing and i kept trying to hit this one note and it cracked and i was like i can't sing anymore so i stopped singing for like three years because i was like my voice had changed i was like 15 you know Uh uh, uh, you know (laughs) (laughs) right and um and so i just stopped singing i really didn't really vocally i sang in the school choir because they went out of town a lot and i knew i could hold a tune uh-huh. So it's just good enough to be in an ensemble, but I never wanted to stand out as a singer. I was just like, let me blend in with everybody else. God, like just hearing just... you say that is just so mind blowing. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> let me stand in the back and yeah. just sing oohs and eyes. I guess I we all had to start somewhere. Right? We all had to start somewhere. Yeah. I was, and it was just mainly because I was scared. I yeah. was terrified of being talked about. You know. Mm-hmm. Honestly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's hard. I mean, I I grew up in the 80s so yeah. i mean i the stigma it was definitely real <laughs> yeah, i mean just being weird i mean like i was telling my friend you know the q in lgbtq is queer but there's lots of straight queer men out there there's lots of straight queer women out there that it just like this this person is weird like, yeah hey look we're not uh, we're not normal like they tell us we should be right and that's what the queer is is more than just sexuality it's it's that interesting it's that you know we're weird we are weird and we'll take it you yeah. know and we yeah. belong on that I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you've been singing, you've been doing band and then like what, what was the point where you came out as a singer? Uh, right after college, I started a tribute to Shaka Khan. I went to my old high school, huh. grabbed some old school musicians. And do you remember Brooklyn's? The um, there used to be a jazz bar in Dallas called Brooklyn's. I wasn't here. Back okay, uh, there was a, it was in Bishop Arts first, and then it moved over to where Southside on Lamar is. And um, I went to B- Brooklyn's with a f- cousin of mine, uh, and I was like, I want to do this, and um, didn't have didn't know where to start. And I just went to my old high school and asked if my band around. Like, you got any kids here that can play? Mm-hmm. He was like, I got a piano player and excuse me, and a young girl that could play the bass. So I grabbed them, took them out of class. That's how much respect I had in my high school anyway. They like, Desmond came in and took two kids out of class and took them to the right. band room and kind of, you know, to, gave them some music to learn. And we had two songs. It was um, Stormy Monday and My Funny Valentine. Mm-hmm. I 
messaged Brooklyn's and I've made it seem like I'm just this big fascinating guy. And they're like, you got the gig, you got it, you got it. <laughs> so I'm like, I got my first gig and I'm excited. And I went to Brooklyn's and she saw me and she saw my little two little musicians that were already too young to get in. <laughs> um, and she's like, no, we're, we're, we're good. We're not. And I said, well, you told me that I could play. And, mm. and, and there's a guy, his name is um, Joe McBride. He's a Dallas, he's a pianist here in Dallas. Sounds he's a familiar. blind guy. Yeah. Um, and he was, it was his night and he was performing. And my brother Jamil was on the drums. And I guess McBride, you know, when you're blind, your hearing is a lot better than anyone else's. So he heard me tell her, like, you said that I could play. And I, mm -hmm. I was complaining. I told the band, well, they're not going to let us play. And he stopped the music. And he was like, if you said he could play, let him play. Mm. And he stopped his set and let us get up. Wow. <laughs> That's class. <laughs> he stopped the set and let us get up there. And we did, and uh, we didn't have a drummer. So Jamil stayed on and played the drums for us. And I did Stormy Monday, my fun of Valentine. And everybody clapped. And I was like, ooh. And that's where the bug came from. Yeah. And it just, you know, goes, I was working at Bank of America. Because I was like, I'm done with music. Some sh stuff happened in my life, and I was like, you know, I'm just gonna focus and be a regular person. <laughs> right. Go work it's at Bank of civilian. America yeah. or something. And and um, my friend, there's a bar is closed. Shout out to Tracy. Um, it was called Pearl at Commerce, and um, we would go there after work for happy hour. And there was this guy, his name was Jeremy. He was up playing the guitar, and my friend kept saying, my my friend Desi Desmond. I wasn't Desi then. Desmond can sing. And he was like, come up and sing. And I went up and sung a, a Sinatra song because I'm a big Sinatra fan. Mm. And he was like, my gosh, that was great. And there was some guys in the audience and it was like, they came and tipped us. He was like, I've never gotten tipped ever before. <laughs> like, he was like, you want to come back next week? I was like, sure. <laughs> and so I started going there every week and, and Tracy was like, Des, the guy quit because he something happened. And I said, well, I want to keep performing. And I started singing the tracks. And then Tracy was like, that's not what this bar is about. If you want to come back, get your real band, and I'll let you back. So that's when I started like really digging into finding musicians and putting together rehearsals and really cultivating my craft. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And so, and at this point, you're probably still doing standards and covers. I was definitely. I was not doing any original. I was doing all standards and covers. Frank Sinatra and and, and Badu and I used to my grandmother of my grandmother's restaurant. Um, I used to. She had a little attic. And um, I, as I was starting my band, I would find band members that were young and I would take them up there and I would give them music lessons so that they could be good enough to play with me. Mm. And uh, we would just be up there practicing and then after, they, after we finished practicing, I would take all the speakers. My grandmother closed at five, so she was like closed, but Deep Ellen was starting to get busy at that time. Mm -hmm. So I would open her doors. I didn't sell anything, but I would put my speakers out there and like just have a piano and a little hi-hat and I had like a little one man show and I used to do like Badu stuff and people pass by and like give me like, I was busking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in Deep Ellum. So. Yeah, but like you were electric though. <laughs> well, I had electric, yeah, I had my grandmother, I just opened the doors and then That's Amy cool. used to tell my grandmother that like, I think they're over there smoking pot and my grandma's like, I've been hearing you smoking pot at the restaurant. I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> That's so yeah, great. I mean, that's where yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I was performing cover music and, and, and I learned so I fell in love with um, the Forever 27 Club. So Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison and mm. all of them were like gods to me at that mm -hmm. time. I was a hippie. I wore a big afro with dashikis. I smelled like Nag Champa all the time. <laughs> like, I'm just like, yeah, peace. You know, that was, <laughs> that was. <laughs> God, we got to find photo of that. <laughs> I can show, I can find it. All right, photo. okay, okay, good. Um, so yeah, but then so what was your catalyst to original songs? Um, I always I want to say about around like 2010. I my my rock band um, I had a rock band called the Gypsy Hideout, which formulated here in Deep Ellum, and we did our first show at um, um, Curtain Club. Um, I wanted we we tr we definitely tried to do some recording. But you know, you, you don't know how to record, you don't know how to record. Mm -hmm. A lot of people feel like, because I can sing, that I can record. Right. And it just doesn't work that way. And sure. so uh, we had that, because we're a group, we can record type situation. And the music was fun and giving it to family members and printing off burnt CDs and stuff, feeling real good. Mm. So that's kind of where it started. But really, honestly, as a recording artist, like officially out there, um, 
I went to the Dallas Observer Awards um, in 2012, and um, Ishi and Meta and all those groups back then, I didn't know any of those guys. I just went because my friend was dating the editor, one of the, the street girls for the Observer. Uh -huh. And so we knew that we wanted our rock band to get some traction. So he's like, well, I'm dating one of the girls. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. <laughs> and so we, they would just tell us, we have this going on. We have, so we and my friend would just go. We like, okay, so I never knew about any award ceremonies or anything. And so I went, saw Ishi up there, Meta, and all of these different groups, Larry G, all these people. And I'm like, who are these people? And I'm writing names down. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm going to find out who these people are. <laughs> and um, the next two years down the road, after finding myself as an artist and becoming solo, um, I decided to, I was like, you know, I've been performing in Deep Element. They should know who I am. Why am I not being brought, talked about and this, that, and the other? And it's because, you know, first of all, who are you? You know, yeah. in my mind, you know, but I got a mention in the Observer for Best Funk and R&B, and I took that and I said, well, I got a mention, so let me get some music out there. And so I had already had some stuff in the vault, and I just immediately started um, getting into the, the seriousness of it, like getting a real editor, which I was working with, Josh Good at the time and mm. showing me the real intricateness of recording. And I was like, I want it to sound like this. I didn't, you know, as an artist, we all know what we want stuff to sound like, but it's hard to convey it to an editor or to a to an engineer. And so I didn't, I knew that I wanted this sound and it just wasn't happening. I was getting frustrated. I'm like, I don't know what to do, but I knew what sounds I was emulating. So I went and learned, um, at that time I was trying to emulate Lady Gaga's art pop. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a sound that I had never heard before. It was just, EDM was hot at the time, so it was just lots of blasts and sounds, and I was like, I want that. And so I just studied her album. I found out all the patches, found out each producer, what they use. I wrote it down, made a little thing, and I took it to the engineer, and he was like, now we can work. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's when I learned, oh, okay, so this is a process. It's, you can't just go in and be like, ha la la la. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, right. So yeah, that's really when it started as a recording artist, and then I've been recording music ever since, trial and error, and yeah, to even up to now. Yeah. Right, right. And so I feel like I heard that, like, but like in some of those Observer Awards or some of those, you were like kind of making statements in some way. Like, what, what is that? Uh, yeah, uh, like I told you, I was afraid to sing. Uh -huh. So my first full body of work was called Crucifixion on the Dance Floor. My first song is called Lose Control. Uh -huh. Um. So I was breaking out of this shell of not queerness or gayness, just Desmond, me, mm -hmm. just being the most authentic, real me that I could be. And the only way that I could do that was to crucify all of my insecurities. Mm. So crucifixion on the dance floor is what that came from. And it even stands out when I would tell guys and when I'm performing, you're always worried about not getting laid or getting girls if you dance you're gonna get laid. <laughs> so crucify that insecurity of people worried about you and get out there and dance and you can leave home with a chick. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I like that. <laughs> so crucify your insecurity so that you can be the best you. Yeah. And that's what that's yeah. what I was really pushing. And, and then um, at the time, you know, I, 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 I'm a big sacrilegious person and I like to tickle sit to make people be like, oh my gosh, why is he doing that? And who better to emulate than Gaga and Madonna so I just kind of adopted their sacrilegious stuff and I brought crosses into the situation and, <laughs> and um, to the point where um, hanging with artists, um, visual artists, and, and, and I was like, you know, I should crucify myself like Jesus did at 33. <laughs> and my friend goes, let's do it. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he was like, let's do it. And so I was like, well, how are we gonna do it? And he was like, I don't know, but let's do it. And so I got with some in-friends. We built a six foot real cross, like painted it white, and um, I, I, I had a big show at the Public Trust, which was another thing that got a lot of publicity here uh -huh. in the city, this pop star sacrilegious guy. And I kind of gave my story about being, you know, my family trying to convert me to being straight and all this. So it was just a whole right. thing around this, like this pop star is crazy. He's sacrilegious, he's wearing leather, he's, <laughs> God, who the hell is this? Right. And that's what happened. That's, yeah. that's how that, and it was all just for me re releasing my fear. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good lesson. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's, yeah, everybody's got to face it, but I mean, yeah. you, <laughs> not everybody blows it out of the water like that. Well, I'm, a, I'll, I'm iconic, honey. So I'm yeah. going to always do things like over the top yeah. at all times. It's just 
my family was like that even without the gay part. My grandmother wore the biggest hats and we had a restaurant downtown in Deep Ellum. So we were always the center of attention in, in, in Oak Cliff. Everybody knew who my grandmother was. We just did things over the top. On Thanksgiving, uh -huh. we would literally load up five and six trucks and go to the thing, but we made sure Vern's place was on there, so you know where it came from, you know, so right. that's just, yeah. it's in me to just go over the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Till cool. somebody tells you to calm down. <laughs> right, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it, it's, I like it. Okay, so then, you know, you're having some success here, but like, what is success in Dallas, ultimately, with music, and so, like, I guess you felt the pull, or was it, was it just that the scene here wasn't what you wanted to be, that you went to New York City? For you, you or? know, I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very emotional person, and um, I, I, I was searching for something else, um, in New York that that New York had that I didn't have here, mm -hmm. um, and it has nothing to do with music, but I did intertwine it because I was like, I didn't have a big queer presence, I had made this huge presence in Deep Ellum, everybody know who I am, I can do whatever I want in Deep Ellum, but then I go over to Cedar Springs and they're like, who are you? Mm. So that bothered me. Mm. And so um, I tried to dig, dig deep into that scene and it just wasn't wasn't opening up to me. I want, and, and like I told you, being I mean, a fan of Gaga and Madonna, I want to be around the gays. Mm -hmm. And it just wasn't fun here for me for it. And I was like, I would visit New York and I'd be like, this is where I belong. Now as a musician, it wasn't a good decision, but as an artist and as a fantasizer, it was perfect mm -hmm. for me. I was able to, to, I said New York gave me my fantasy back because I lost the fa fantasy and I was so focused on the reality. And New York gave me that fantasy of, you. if you want to walk in with a Cadillac, you can build your own Cadillac and act, you know, like mm -hmm. whatever you want to happen, visualize it and you can do it because you can make it happen. And that's what I learned. And I sang with drag queens and I didn't have a band behind me like I normally did. I had just my tracks and putting together fun shows to just still attract people. So. Mm -hmm. That that was my whole reason for that. I also was, you know, I wanted to explore men more. I felt like it wasn't down here. Texas people, even the queers, are a little bit too put together for me. Hmm. And um, I felt like the the type of man that I wanted to date was in New York. It just wasn't here. Still to this day, I feel that way. Mm -hmm. I'm just here by the grace of the uh, Caveta, right? Uh, the pandemic. But like, I still feel like my guy is not here. Yeah, in Dallas, I'm. Uh, it's sometimes I don't even think he's American. It's gonna be a guy mm -hmm. that don't even. That's probably not. And if, I don't care if I get a guy or not. But at that time, in the words of Sarah Jessica Parker, we all go to New York to find love, mm -hmm. and that was one of the goals. I wanted to go and find love truly and freely. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you found love, just not romantic love. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Texas is Texas is. If you want to relax. And you want to and raise your family and all that stuff. Come down here, you know. Mm -hmm. Texas is perfect, but if you want to make a change and really, really do some things, it you just and you can still come down here. Just be prepared that it's not gonna change as quickly as you want it to. Sure. Versus, you can go to New York and stand on the corner and start an alliance. You'll get fifty people. <laughs> right, but my like, yeah, for sure. But my my feeling when I went to New York, and I haven't been in New York in a long time. I'm actually I was born in New York, but I haven't been there in a while, and yeah. uh, I just felt like everything's not everything's been tried there's still if you can come up with something you can do it but yeah. like good luck because there's like and like getting attention in New York I guess well I shouldn't say that I never had a t luck getting attention with my music and yeah. so you have already you already had figured that out when you got to New York yeah um, I you did that with getting attention musically was hard you know um, it I, still is hard yeah as an artist period you know yes. um, but you know I just went there with a goal in mind I knew that I created this huge craze here with Crucifixion on the Dance Floor. So I said, I'm just gonna go back to New York as if I just released it and just live it all over again. So I still had that same energy mm -hmm. that I had here and it just made people look. And plus I paid attention, you know, a lot of artists, I had noticed a lot of new artists, they just kind of expect things to just fall right in front of them yeah. and it happens. But when someone tells you, this is where all the people hang out at, go. Mm -hmm. If they tell you this is where this person that books this situation, he does this, go. If you don't go, then you'll never know. You'll be sitting there mad because you didn't get picked. And so I listened to everybody in New York talk about Horachata is the hottest person. She throws all the big parties in. She's from San Antonio. San Antonio, we're both Texans. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. lock all of this out. And then I went. It's almost like a model. Go on your go season. Go to all of them. Introduce yourself. Let them know who you are. I opened up for a huge drag queen here in Dallas. I mean, she's from 
from Pittsburgh, but she, I asked her, I know you're popular in New York. Who do I need to talk to? And can you give me a seal of... And she's like, yeah, tell them Sherry Needle sent you. And I just used her name mm-hmm. to make for people to be like, oh, wow. you know. And so it's there's ways of getting yourself out there, not being a, 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 a shark, but just really just going and see, finding opportunities for yourself. Sure. Getting to know people, introducing yourself. And don't ask nobody, can you be on their show if you never went to the show? <laughs> right. That's a good advice. That's very good advice. You know, like, yeah. and I learned that from a queen. You want to be on my show, girl, come see the show. And then maybe we'll yeah. talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, when I was in bands in LA, that was a big thing. It's like, you have to go to other people's shows. You have, you have to, to support. Go. And I don't know if that's a thing here as much now. I believe we had it at one point. I'm, I, my, we did. I, we, I, that was a scene that I felt good in. Mm-hmm. I still feel good in our scene now because a lot of those people are still here. But it, it is kind of, it is. Because mm-hmm. there was one point we were at, I try to go to everybody's shows as much mm-hmm. as I can, but then I'm 41 now. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I'm rather be at home with the cats. Oh, trust me. <laughs> but um, but I do, I try to make it a point, like that was something that you were at last night and I wanted to go so bad, but I was just like, but I'm so comfy right now. Yeah. And it was at the Deep Ellum Art Co, you yep, know? Yep. And I wanted to go, but like, try your best to go to stuff. You know, um, you know, yeah. if, you, if, you're, if you're a hip hop artist, find out where the open mics are. If you're an R&B, go to the Freeman. You know, that's where all the R&B acts are. You know, so anyway, I'm talking too much. No, not at all. <laughs> what? Let me ask you this: Like, what do you? What did you bring back from New York? Like, stage wise? Like, what? Like, like you know, did you go and discover something that you brought back to this community to like live and stuff? Fantasy, um, that I could do anything on stage. I can do lights. I could do whatever. It was just that because if you you think of a drag queen and they get so much respect, and you would think that they have a whole production, they're lip syncing Beyonce, mm-hmm. literally lip syncing, but they create this this fantasy. They are Beyonce. Are we create if it's if it's a song about breaking my soul, it'd be a big old heart with a it's just taking it to the top. And that's what I got from mm-hmm. that. And I was doing it already, but it was just like keep doing it. And it's just going over the top and just giving the best shows possibly. Mm-hmm. It's like making people be like, Why almost to the point where every show that I see sometimes in Dallas and I, I can I'm always like, Baby, if y'all just Thought a little bit mm. more artistically, yeah, do, you know. Yeah, I don't mean, just go up and show us your songs. And and I hate it when an artist goes, "This is the new one." Yeah, hope you like it. Yeah. You know, no, don't yeah. do that. Just perform. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, like at the tail. At, well, even before I was done playing, it occurred to me that, like the only way to stand out is to not play a gig. You have to play shows. Yeah, they the have concerts. Be, yeah, they have the performances. Concerts. And like I was like, I was even considering like maybe. It's so elaborate that you can only do it for one weekend and you don't do it again for six months or mm-hmm, something. But mm-hmm. but something like you, you, people are coming out there like it's hard enough to get them there. You're entertaining them. You're already, like, you know, they're going to like the music, but you're not at home. You, if you want to just listen to music, sit at home, yeah. listen to it. Like you give them something that they, you know, that's why I was known for climbing on top of the bar, pouring a bottle of water on me or mm-hmm. throwing a bottle of water out of somebody or just just going over the top, and of course, we learned those. I learned those things from you know people like Freddie Mercury, Madonna, and, mm-hmm. and Grace Jones, and their shows. And then, of course, I learned the intricateness of movement from Michael and Janet. You know, just you know, just sit. You can sing your song just like this, and mm-hmm. everybody, they, they you, you can yeah. dance. Yeah. You know, just those little small little quirks that gives your music what it needs to be sold. Because this is what we're trying to sell is the music. Yeah. Make people sing your song, and um, I believe I have that formula. Um. Uh-huh. I've tr- tried to work with several, you know, labels and everything, and everything that they always try to say is, "This song is good; it just doesn't match your performance." And we've always been trying to match the recording with what I deliver live, uh-huh. you know. And I can honestly say, I'm, I'm, I feel that I'm on, my, yeah, and I'm on mm. my way there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and the Grateful Dead. Huh? That was their problem. They were like play live, and everyone would be like, "We can't get that on the record." Mm-hmm. I know, like that's probably millions of times people compared to you, the great. <laughs> I'm an entertain. I mean, as much as I like to record, I'm an entertainer first. Oh yeah, I love the stage, right? The I lights, see sweat. Yeah, you know that's the best. What I like, and then everything else can come after that or with it. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to what's coming up here, um, the Dallas Entertainment Industry Awards. Is that the name? Dallas Entertainment Awards. Dallas yeah. Entertainment Awards. Mm-hmm. So let's. How did that? come about like what was the brainchild behind that you know back to this what you was just saying you know how you know people don't go to people's shows anymore um in lately because you know i feel like there was a sense of community that we had here uh we got excited for the end of the year in december and october when the dallas observer music awards came around Mm -hmm. we would be so excited that 
we would guide our year for that. We went to each other's shows. We put shows together so that we could all get together at the end of the year mm -hmm. and, and, and celebrate and be cute, you know? Sure. It's hard for musicians to come together all because if we if all the musicians came together on a Saturday, I would be worried. That means they're not working. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So to have a, a day where all the musicians are off and they can all come and celebrate each other because no matter what, we are out here because we want people to see what we do. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more than exciting than your peers. Right. Celebrating what you it's do. It's true. Yeah. It's, a, it's one of the most amazing feelings. So I know how that feels. I know that there was a void missing in the city. And I have my eyes on everything because it's just naturally in me. And I just watch what every artist and what everybody's doing. If I see that, I, I look at I look at three links to see what shows they have, even if I don't know who the bands are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I was like, uh, you know, the the shout out to the Deep Ellum Community Center and to the Deep Ellum Foundation and Deep Ellum Community Association. Mm -hmm. They had the grand opening here, um, and I had I kind of been talking to it to my, to my friend, not really thinking about executing it, but I said I want to get more involved with the behind the scenes with Deep Ellum, so I'm gonna go up to their grand opening. And then when I said, I want to talk to whoever the president is, I didn't know who, I don't, right. I don't know the levels of what anybody is. I'm like, who was the president? And right. then I talked to him, I'm like, V, can I, this, it's Brianni. Oh, Brianni, oh, I know her. Sure. So um, we get here and we got to talking and I, I, I pitched it to her, but I wasn't pitching it. I was just telling her what was missing. And she was like, let's do it. And I was like, okay, with this next year? She goes, oh, this year. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> right. and, um, and I was hesitant because I'm like, okay, it's, and at that time it was September because that's when we, and I was like, whoa, um, that's a little bit of time. And a good friend of mine that I look up to that I've done lots of productions with, big productions, and I told them about it. And they were like, Des, if anybody can pull this off, I know for a fact you can. And that gave me the, hmm. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's try it. And, um, it's you know it was bigger than me. Um, I I felt like I feel like I've done so much work as an artist. I might not be on the billboards or the Grammys, but my knees tell me <laughs> <laughs> right. that I've put in some work. Sure. You know, and I know this scene, and I could put you in the right places where you need to go. If you were to come to Dallas right now and say, I don't know what I need to do, but I want to do it, I could tell you exactly where to go. Mm -hmm. And that's a gift that I have from knowing this city. And so. Um, I decided to do that, and then I would reach out to my peers, and I was like, hey, we're going to do an award ceremony. Remember the Domas? Well, I'm, I'm going to do it, and I'm doing it. And they're all like, oh, cool. But no one's like, oh, okay. You know, they're just like <laughs> ignoring the fact. And I'm just like, I'm serious. Like, I'm doing it. And no yeah, one's yeah. like picking up on it. And so um, I was like, how are we going to get, we would have meetings with, with, with the board. And I was like, how are we going to get this, you know, started? How are we going to get people to talk about it? And I was just at my house one day, and I made a um, a, a flyer thing for Quentin Gray. Mm -hmm. He's a pianist, and um, I made one for him. And then I was like, "Let me just make one for this group." I was like, "Let me make one for this group." It's, and it was just basically saying, "Nominate me for." And then I shared it, and I tagged them, and then they shared it, and then they, you know, and then it created this ripple effect. I want one, <laughs> and then that's, that's yeah. how it. Yeah. All trickled to where, like, where we're like, okay, now we got something to work with, because we didn't at right, first. Right. I, I kind of, I stared that up a little bit because n no one was like, okay, well, let's show us, you know. Yeah. And so that's how that happened. I, I did not, you know, I reached out to Double Wide, Free Man, Three Links, Revelers Hall, because I don't know all the genres in this city. I don't mm -hmm. know all the bands, and I told them what I was doing, and I said, send me some recommendations of people that come to that, that play there I would look at look them up to make sure and they they were sending me Nick from Double Y Adam from Three Lanes they were all sending me artists and stuff to just mm -hmm. go through and then I started having fun because I started listening to everybody's music and, and it was just like oh my gosh this is crazy and as I was getting music and getting artists I was creating this huge playlist on Spotify just throwing the music over there and I'm like we really got some good stuff going on in oh, this city yeah, man yeah it's true and it's just you know and, and, and so it just I just started getting more passionate about it, and and this is just where we are. We got the Latino Cultural Center, and we have some of the biggest acts performing the night of, and people are actually on board with this situation. Just to yeah. see it out in the city and everybody talking about it, it's just like it's a dream come true to be in this room with all of these creatives 
like we were gonna get all pay money for decorations and stuff. I was like, no, the artists are the decoration. You know, like seriously. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. so that's really what this is. This is just me doing what I love. You know, my passion has always been music, family, and people, and um, and this is just something that I brought up, and I'm executing it, and we're doing it, and now it's just growing to some other amazing yeah. stuff that's gonna keep pushing community and music. Yeah, no, I mean, it's been really kind of cool to see just how many people have gotten excited about it already, and yeah. the, the nominees are super excited. And I know, like, to me, the test of, like, is this, like, legit? I've had a few people privately be like, well, I didn't get nominated, and I'm like, you know, next year, you didn't maybe you didn't know about it, but it's like, well, it's already something that is coveted mm-hmm. in that way, and mm-hmm. so it was really cool to see that, so, yeah. um, you know. Um, it's, Dude, you don't understand, I watched because the award ceremony is mostly important to me so I watched the Grammys from 1979 all the way up to now I was just on YouTube and I had so much fun I would literally come home and have the Grammy I would watch two Grammy Awards in one night oh you wow know, I watched the 86 Grammy Awards in 1987 and I skipped and watched 2006 Grammy Awards just to watch and yeah. just I love I've always loved awards and when me my friends were kids in high school we would get together to watch the MTV Awards and stuff like that because mm. that was just something we did. So who wouldn't want to take this, This, you know? Yeah. And and it's an iconic thing to do, and I do iconic shit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, like, people just go to the website and they can vote, like, multiple times, one time? How's that work? Now, um, so right now, um, and the things are all in trial and error. So the, at the beginning, it was the... the um, as far as us getting to tell an artist to tell their fans mm-hmm. to nominate them. Okay. And that was over from November 1st to the 31st of December, which was a lot. Um, it, that that part alone, that's why next year I'm going to have to get a team. Mm-hmm. That part process alone was just going through all the different artists. And going a lot of categories. How many categories? And, there's 85 categories. Okay, that's a lot, But then yeah. each of them, like like the, the content, you know, is like, you had to release content in 2023. Mm-hmm. There are people putting their songs on there from 20, you know, 22 and sure. 21. So we had to go through all of that mm-hmm. because there were worthy people that were up there, but they released it in 2022. We said 2023. Mm-hmm. So we had to go through all of that criteria and making sure that they did do shows and looking at their flyers. And that was the hard part. Part now we actually have people that you can see and nom- I mean, vote for that are officially nominated. Mm-hmm. True enough, we didn't get it to where you can vote only once. We're going to do that better next year. But um, it seems to be working out. I'm looking at it. I try not to look at it every day because it's whatever it is, <laughs> is what it is. Mm-hmm. Versus when I was doing it in November, I had to look at it every day because I was editing. Tallying. The, yeah, 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 exactly. So this one is different. But, yeah, this is just what's – yeah, you vote once, hopefully. You vote once. And uh, we're, we're looking at the emails, and we're being very strategic with everything. And you just vote for whoever's there. And it, yeah. it seems – to be going really well. We had some mishaps in the beginning with spellings of names. Yeah. Um, you know, because we were going by the majority of what, you know, if the somebody spelled Scarlet from from King Clown that way with an E at the end, that was like, well, that's the majority, so we're gonna use that. Right. Go with it. So but we made sure we corrected every name that that felt that they were, you know, I just I'm very personal with these people. So people are inboxing me or us. Yeah. And I'm making sure that I reply to them. And there was people that were upset that they didn't make it and you know, I, I didn't break it down all the way. I just told him, you know, let's try next year. You were close. Mm-hmm. You know, but keep doing what you're doing. You know, it's no, you know what I'm saying? And like, sure. hope to see you at the ceremony, you know, type stuff. Absolutely. Because like, yeah. I know how it feels to be left out. But I will say this. Now that we've learned that it's here next year, everybody can should do better by getting I, people to vote I for them. I think that a lot. Of, you'll, I think you're going to need a team because I think it'll yeah. be overwhelming next year. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's. I'll be totally candid. I mean, I got nominated for a few things, and you know, I'm flattered and honored. Um, but what really touches me is when, like, I'm going on Facebook and someone either I don't know well or don't know at all mm-hmm. is posting about that about me or mm-hmm. commenting about me, and I'm just like, I can only imagine how musicians are feeling and and everybody's feeling. And one thing I you know. said, maybe musicians are hams. <laughs> yeah. One thing they love to do is see their name. Yeah, and I said this is not going to because you know I was everybody's like, are you sure? You want to take on this responsibility? It's not a responsibility. It's a it's a it's a duty yeah. to shine light on people, on everyone, and not just myself. So I've always been that way, and so it's like when it comes to artists, I knew once I made those FYCs for them, and then so another artist saw, it, I knew that that was going to trigger. Like, I want one. Mm-hmm. I want one because everybody wants to be seen. They work hard. We record in music, doing residencies all of this stuff all year and we want to be seen for what we did so this is a moment where 
even though there are people that are talking about it, but the people that are talking about it are not artists. We have a city full of artists that are happy right now, mm -hmm. and two or three people that are talking crap. So, well, you know, okay. I haven't even seen the crap, honestly. I mean, I, I've, I, I've seen I, confusion. I, I, there, I, I haven't seen confusion. Mean, I have gotten some things, yeah, personally. Okay. Um, and I can, there's nothing I can't handle. But, but again, I, it just shows that you're doing something right because, yeah. like, you're always going to have haters if you're doing right. something right. And and it does, I mean, look, I, I, I was never nominated for an Observer Award. And then I, it, I, there was times where I would have appreciated it. And mm -hmm. I mean, granted, I wasn't at a level at that point of people knowing me. So mm -hmm. I get like how people feel both directions. But I, I think you, you looked at the community and saw a void and you stepped up. And I mm -hmm. think that everybody that, that appreciates and it is 85 obvious. categories. And you know, that's 425 people because mm. there's five nominees in each category. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll take that back because we gave, we, we were given the Lifetime Achievement Award and the Fashion um, Icon Award, but everything else is categorized. Mm. And um, just alone, I, I didn't want anybody, if we went from door person to, to flyers, we wanted yeah. everybody to, to feel You really did, the sound guys. About the stuff. Even like right now, I'm printing off certificates for nominees so that they can have a, a certificate that they feel, hey, you got something, you know what I'm, yeah. I want people to feel good. Yeah, people, you know, we live here and you forget, this is a huge city, this is a huge entertainment community mm -hmm. and it's special mm -hmm. to be recognized and yes. I appreciate that you're doing it and I know a lot of people are too. Yeah, I'm um, grateful to do it. I'm grateful to even just have the, the, the will to do so, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm ready for the ceremony. <laughs> yeah, right on, right on. Well, this is going to air before, so you'll have a chance to go to the La La Latino Cultural Center. Is that right? Yes, the uh, Latino Cultural Center, January 31st, mm -hmm. um, 6 o'clock to 11. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Hey, Des, great having you down. Thanks again. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, too. And we'll also be looking for your you have music coming out as well. I do. Um, I, you, because we didn't even get to go there. Cause oh. I knew we, no, that's okay. Um, we, got, I, we got a little time to. No, I am working on an album. Um, like I told you, uh, I'm, I'm releasing an album called Key at the Door. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working on it for the past two years now. Oh, okay. Um, I, I started recording it in March 22, and it's 24, right? Yeah, so um, I've been in the works with that. Engineers, I wanted it to, to be like top of the line sound. So I've been very picky. But normally I'm just like, oh, it's good, let's release it. Where versus this is a body of work. It's almost to me like my bow out. Um, not bow out like here you go. But I've been in this industry since two thousand eight and I've never got a a recording to my to my satisfaction. Uh my only my own work. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right. Yeah. I want this project to be to my satisfaction and I'm not letting it out until I'm satisfied. And um it's going really well. Um songs are taking like six and seven months. I have Analog musicians, and we're we're really dissecting this music, and and it's really really fun and good. Sometimes I'm like, am I am is it really gonna happen? Because I've said it so many times. I got an album coming out. I got an album coming out. Well, I haven't been saying it, um, because but now I can really say that I have. I'm cooking up some good, mm. some good stuff. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, it's more R and B. So the the pop guy that you all have known, um, is he still in there in in me? But this album is an ode to uh, the 80s music that I grew up to, to rock with you, Michael Jackson, Never Too Much, Luther Vandross, and Shaka Khan, and and, and, and all of that. that and that's what this sound is. But, um, you know, my first song that I released, Pick Up Your Phone, which just has that nostalgia to it, but that's probably the only nostalgic. So other than that, it's all 80s, very, you got to feel like you can go into an 80s bar, like, because mm. in, 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 that's what I want. Because okay. I'm an 80s baby. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> and you have, you, you're you still not quite clear on when that's coming out. Not quite clear. I will say um, hopefully before my birthday in the summer. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thanks again, Des. It Thank was great. you very much. It's a pleasure. And I'll have you on um, in the spotlight with Desi soon. Okay. I'm glad that you even asked me. You know, I don't, it's not often I get to talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I think it was a fun time. I'm sure people are going to dig it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to thank my guest, Desi Five. You can check out his music in the links below, as well as all the information on the Dallas Entertainment Awards. Thank you again to the Deep Ellum Community Center for letting us record there. Theme song, Unstoppable by Celine Narala. Thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, follow all the good stuff, and share it with your friends. We'll see you next time.